the crusaders who came in sent by the pope himself the catholic church they came in and they destroyed the population they killed everything everyone and everything even animals were killed by the crusaders and the question may come to your mind that how was it possible where were the muslims what happened to them why couldn't they defend the city this is a very good question it so happened that the crusaders came to the middle east at the time when muslims were fighting each other bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin was salatu was salam ala khatamil anbiya wa sayyidil mursalin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al ghurril mayamin ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد اعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما ارسلناك الا رحمه للعالمين وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم المسلم واخو المسلم لا يظلمه ولا يسلمه من كان في حاجه اخيه كان الله في حاجته Aw kama qala alay salatu salam respected brothers and everyone listening today's topic is a very vast topic to address in a very short time but i want to give you the main points on the life of this great magnificent personality we are going to address and looking at the current situation in palestine the genocide that's taking place this entity has never been exposed to this level before and apologists for this genocide facilitators of this genocide people who are trying to rationalize this genocide and that may include journalists and politicians they are complicit in it so It so happened that this topic I am going to address is directly linked to the history of Palestine. The reason why Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, very commonly known as Salahuddin or Salahuddin or Saladin to the Europeans, his name was Yusuf Ibn Najmuddin Ayyub. His father's name was Najmuddin Ayyub. and it is after his name the dynasty is called the ayyubid dynasty he was the founder sultan salahuddin ayyubi was the founder of this dynasty called the ayyubid dynasty he was the first powerful ruler of this dynasty and allah gave him this status because of his sincerity his dedication his efforts and his selfless struggle to liberate al quds the third holiest site in islam the city of jerusalem is sacred to muslims it is also sacred to the jewish people and it is sacred to the christian people so This city had been ruled by many different dynasties, different kings in different periods, including the Jewish people. They ruled it once upon a time. And then this territory fell into the hands of the Romans. The Romans they destroyed the city of Jerusalem completely in the year 132 CE. due to a revolt a rebellion against the roman authorities launched by a messianic figure called bar kokhba he was a messianic leader of the jewish community in palestine at the time and this revolt was crushed severely by the then roman emperor called hadrian you might have heard this name before because those who know the british history you would know that there is a place or there is a monument called hadrian's wall it goes from coast to coast in northern britain you can find its beginning 
where it starts in the city of Newcastle. This is where it begins, and it goes all the way. Uh, it goes all the uh, all the way to the other side of the coast. This wall was built by this very powerful Roman emperor called Hadrian. He ruled territory from Britain to the Middle East and parts of North Africa. Very big, large empire. So he decided to level the city to the ground and rename it Elia or Elia after his own name. His name was Elias Hadrianus. And from that time on, the Jewish people were banished. They were not allowed to come back to the city of Jerusalem. You cannot be found in this territory. Any Jew found in Palestine would be killed on the spot by the Roman authorities. Then begins the Jewish diaspora or Jewish uh, spread, exile into the world. So the Jewish people, they became scattered. They became nomadic. They were taking refuge in different places at different times with different dynasties. Then came the Christians to power. Some Roman emperors converted to Christianity, starting with Constantine. And then later on, other Roman emperors accepted Christianity. And this territory was ruled by Christians. Christians were also very hostile to the Jewish people. Others were arguing, no, we must keep them alive because they bear testimony to our Lord, Jesus Christ. Because there are prophecies about him in the Old Testament and we need the Jewish people to bear testimony to the Old Testament and its veracity. Therefore, keep them alive. And one such person was St. Augustine who argued in this way. And the Jewish people were given respite. They were tolerated in Christendom, but still not allowed to come back to the city of Jerusalem. I'm, you know taking huge leaps, historically speaking, because I cannot, this is, my, not, this is not my topic today. My topic today is not to indulge in the history of the Jewish people and their suffering uh, when it comes to the land of Palestine and whatever uh, is relevant to that particular history. I'm just giving you this very brief introduction to this territory called Palestine. So how did the Jewish people survive then is the question. How did the Jewish people survive, the Israelites? How did they survive for so long? Islam. This may shock you. Because the propaganda you get exposed to every single day on news channels, they will try to claim that the Muslims were as hostile as the Europeans or Christians were to the Jewish people. This is a great lie. This is a huge lie. You must understand this history. Stay with me so that you know why. Muslims are so important when it comes to the land of Palestine in particular because it is this land where all three major faiths claim territory. Every single faith, Islam, Christianity and Judaism have a claim to this land. They claim this land as their own. And we have to assess every single claim independently, fairly, justly. When we do, we come to realize that the only time three faiths coexisted in this territory was when the Muslims were ruling. I can guarantee you that. In the last 1,400 years, every time the Muslims ruled this territory, they had peace, harmony, coexistence. And the Jewish and the Christian and the Muslim people were able to worship collectively in this holy sanctuary. The Temple Mount, which is about 35 odd acres of land in the city of Jerusalem, is the holiest site where the Temple of Solomon stood once upon a time. What we call Masjid al-Aqsa. And the Quran mentions that very spot. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير Glory be to the one who took his slave Muhammad in one night صلى الله عليه وسلم from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa 
which has been blessed even the surroundings of this area have been blessed so that we may show our signs to him so long story short in the year 636 ce about 15 hijri 15 exactly 4 years after the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away muslims take the city and then they open open the city for the jewish people for the first time in nearly 500 years or just say less over 400 years they had been banished they were not allowed to come back to the city first by the romans then by the christians long story why what happened you know details are far too long for me to indulge in at this stage i'm going to fast forward and from that time onwards the muslims ruled the city and they allowed the jews and the christians to coexist the christians did not want the jewish people in jerusalem but the muslims said no they have a right they are israelites they are banu israel they have a right to be there we will protect them we will give them refuge we don't agree with them we believe they are disbelievers but they have the right to be here because they have a claim to this land so let them worship and they did worship and the jewish people flourished in this city and not only in this city throughout the muslim territory over 90% of the jewish people for 1000 years lived in muslim lands i will repeat this so that you remember this over 90% of the jewish people in the world majority the overwhelming majority of the jewish people in the world lived in muslim lands for 1000 years from al andalus to india the, the the entire stretch of the muslim civilization for 1000 years they felt safe protected and they flourished the best philosophers the best theologians the best rabbis the best poets the best intellectuals the best politicians the best physicians from the jewish community were born in the muslim territory and those who lived outside of the muslim territory always felt threatened and always faced a prospect of extinction at the hands of the christians mainly the jewish people were banished exiled killed massacred many times in the christian world including right here in britain first before richard the lionheart when he was leaving for a crusade to fight sultan salahuddin a, a pogrom took place against the jewish people and even during the first crusade when these crusaders when they left europe after the pope delivered a speech in 1095 ce in a city called clermont in france he delivered a speech in 1095 telling all the european knights that you fight each other why do you fight each other go and fight the enemy the infidel in the middle east they persecute your brothers the christians which was a lie this was a lie it was a pack of lies and the real issue the real reason why pope delivered the speech was the seljuk victory in the battle of manzikert in 1071 the seljuks defeated the roman army and took as a result what we call today turkey you think turkey is only istanbul no turkey is anatolia what we call asia minor it is like a continent it is huge territory the entire land mass of turkey okay from literally from bursa bursa to syria all of this land mass came to muslims as a result of one battle the battle of manzikert fought by sultan alp arsalan who was a seljuk ruler against the roman emperor romanus who was captured in battle who was captured in battle this this sent this victory of the muslims sent shivers down the spines of christendom and then the emperor alexius the roman the byzantine emperor alexius wrote a letter to the pope asking him for help we need help we're losing territory we're losing land to islam and muslims 
and pope delivered the speech as a result and the speech if it's true if it did actually occur was a pack of lies so the jewish when these crusaders having listened to the pope started their journey to liberate the holy land from the infidel the muslims on their way to palestine they massacred every single jewish population in germany so it were the europeans the christians the catholics who committed massacres against the jewish people not the muslims in fact jewish people flourished they were the most prosperous people in the world at the time in fact the prime minister to the most powerful muslim king in western europe in the 10th century was a jewish man called hazda ibn shaprut he was the prime minister of abdurrahman the 3rd the khalifa who declared his caliphate from cordoba in 929 ce in the 10th century so this propaganda is false is absolutely false okay jewish historians will tell you themselves that the golden age of the house of israel was in alandalus in spain when muslims are ruling for from for, for from 950 to 1250 300 years were the best period in jewish history since the diaspora since the diaspora since the exile initiated by the roman emperor hadrian in 132 ce the best period in jewish history was in islamic spain for 300 years and jewish rabbis themselves they testify to this bahia bin bakuda was a jewish rabbi writing in the 11th century in 1080s he testifies to this fact that since the diaspora this is the best period in our lives so islam gave refuge not only to the jewish people even the even to the christians to come and worship in peace in the city of jerusalem every time the city was taken oppression followed and there are two times when the city was lost to either the christians or the jewish uh, elements okay how christian were the crusader is a good question how jewish are the zionists is also a very good question they claim connection to judaism they claim to be jewish but how jewish are these zionists who are bombing gaza right now killing thousands of children deliberately by targeting them how jewish are they is a very good question and there are jewish rabbis around the world there are jewish activists they're saying not in our name these people are not jewish they are atheists they don't believe in god they are godless people they don't believe in god yet they believe in his promise okay so after the crusades long story short the pope delivers the speech and crusaders come and take the city of jerusalem very long story short i mean we need an entire series of lectures on the crusades themselves because it's a very long history but long story short it takes the crusaders after the speech of pope urban the second it takes them nearly four years to take the city of jerusalem they start their journey and some of them make it to the city of jerusalem in 1099 ce 1099 and they take the city and they massacre the entire population they kill muslims jews and christians the crusaders who came in sent by the pope himself the catholic church they came in and they destroyed the population they killed everything everyone and everything even animals were killed by the crusaders and the question may come to your mind that how was it possible where were the muslims what happened to them why couldn't they defend the city this is a very good question it so happened that the crusaders came to the middle east at the time when muslims were fighting each other the seljuks having defeated one of the greatest armies on the planet the romans the seljuks started to fight each other and the crusaders took advantage of this and even the fatimids took advantage of it and they took the city of jerusalem so when the crusaders took the city it was ruled by the fatimids they took the city from the fatimids and now once the city was taken by the crusaders 
you know, ripple effects went throughout the Muslim world. Poets were going to, you know, cry and invoke the att- attention of the Muslim Ummah. Because the Caliph, the Abbasid Caliph was in Baghdad. So a poet called Abu al-Mudhafar, Abi Wardi, he went uh, to Baghdad and he, in his powerful poetry, he tried to invoke the Muslim attention. Where are you, the Muslims? Look what's happening to the land of Asham. We have been invaded by these barbarians, these crusaders, and they have massacred our populations. How can your eyes sleep when your brothers in Asham are sleeping in the bellies of vultures? This, this is his poetry. Abu al-Muzaffar Abi Wardi. Okay. But the Muslims of Baghdad, unfortunately, were not moved. They didn't see the threat as urgent as they should have. They just didn't pay much attention to, you know, because there was no social media. The reason why all the Muslims today are completely saddened and blown away by the images that are coming from Gaza of children ripped apart. You know, bombs are literally, you know, mincing them, literally. They are there. When you look at their bodies, it looks like, you know, someone has put them through a mince machine. These little kids, little infants. And they don't care. The ones who are doing it, they don't care. They are doing it with, imp- with impunity. So, there was no social media at the time for them to see the atrocities the crusaders were committing. No words could explain and describe the pain of the people of Palestine at that time when the crusaders took the city. So, they took the city and they established four principalities. Four states in the land of Palestine. They took it from the Seljuks and the, the Muslims at the time. So, these principalities were Edessa, Antioch, Tripoli and Jerusalem. So these are the four Christian crusader states established in the land of Palestine, starting from Edessa, Antioch and Tripoli, which is uh, Tripoli, uh, the city of Lebanon today. Okay, there are a few Tripolis in that region. One Tripoli is in Libya, one Tripoli is in Lebanon. I'm talking about the Lebanese city of Tripoli, right? That was also a crusader principality and Jerusalem. Now what happens? The Muslims are in a state of shock and it took the Muslims a while to wake up to this threat. For some reason, Muslims did not immediately realize that what had happened. They thought that these barbarian, this barbarian horde has come from the north, from somewhere. They had no idea. And this is the first time they were exposed to this phenomenon, co- phenomenon called the Afranj. The Afranj, the Franks. The Muslims referred to these people who were basically um, a mixture of German, French and English knights, warriors who had come to take this land. The Muslims generally called them a frange, the Franks. They called them all the Franks. So they thought these people, these barbarians have come, they will loot and pollute and they'll go back. But they came to stay. They came as settlers. They drove the Muslims out and they established a state called the Crusader State. And these people don't learn from history. They don't realize that Muslims cannot possibly give up this land. That's not going to happen. Muslims did not give up the land even at that time. It took them a while to wake up. It took Muslims a while to wake up. And within 90 years, the Crusaders were gone from Jerusalem. And it took another hundred years for them to be completely driven out of the Middle East, which was done by the Mamluks later on, Sultan Baybars and his successors later on. But it happened. That's the point. You cannot rule this land by force. You cannot occupy this land by oppression and tyranny and destruction and massacres and genocides. The Crusaders did it. They tried it. And... As a result of these crusades, hundreds of thousands of people died. But the land came back to Muslims. Jerusalem came back to Muslims. Bear witness. Because right now what's happening, the Jewish people themselves are coming out and they're saying, not in our name.
Some of the people in New York, thousands of the Jewish, thousands of Jewish people, they're coming out. Some of them are children of the survivors of concentration camps. And they're saying, not in our name. When we say never again, that means for everyone, not only for the Jewish people, right? So, this land will come back to Muslims. Sooner or later, it will come back to Muslims. Crusades did not last. Okay? Oppression and tyranny will not last as well. It will end because, you see, oppressors and tyrants, they have a tendency to self-destruct. They have a tendency to dismantle their own power and ability, which is exactly what they're doing right now. The whole world has now suddenly woken up to this phenomenon. Kill 10,000 people in three weeks. These people have done it. 5,000 children shredded, ripped apart, blown into pieces. 5,000 children. And real number is unknown, by the way. This is a rough estimate. We don't know how many people are in the rubble. So, Sultan Salahuddin, why is he important? Why are we talking about him today? We're talking about him because he was chosen by Allah to liberate the Holy Land. To liberate the Holy Land from the Crusaders. Crusaders, they established their power. And the first opposition against the Crusaders came from a man called Imaduddin Zinki. Imaduddin Zinki was a Seljuk ruler of the city of Mosul in Iraq. Seljuks ruled much of this territory from Persia all the way to Turkey. They ruled a vast territory. This was a very powerful group of Turkic generals and sultans. Who were the Seljuks? How important are they in the history of Islam? A very good topic that we can address another time. Many powerful sultans came from these people, they were originally Central Asian. They were Turkic. And they ruled vast territories between Persia and current day Turkey. That means the Middle East too. So the city of Mosul was ruled by a man called Imaduddin Zinki. He launched the first campaign or first retaliation against crusader aggression. And he took the principality of Edessa. He took the principality of Edessa from the Crusaders. Shivers were sent down the spines of Christendom and the Pope launched the second crusade. Another crusade was sent to take back the principality of Edessa. The second crusade was an absolute failure. An absolute failure. Didn't achieve what it was meant to achieve. Then comes his son, Imaduddin Zinki is killed by his own soldiers and or his own servants and then comes his son called Nuruddin Zinki, a very pious man, a very able, a very upright man who was very, very diligent in his prayers. He used to pray to Hajju that night, very, very diligent, very pious, would love to listen to the hadith of the Prophet Okay, he specifically established endowments, awqaf. He invited the scholars to do public hadith lectures on Fadail al-Quds. He wanted to condition the minds of the Muslims. He wanted to explain to the Muslims why al-Quds is important for us, why Jerusalem is important, why Masjid al-Aqsa is important for us, for us to take it back from the crusaders because Muslims didn't seem to get the point. So he did public lectures. He got the ulama to read Fadail al-Quds, a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ on the virtues of the land of Asham, Bilad Asham, what we call Greater Syria, and specifically the virtues of Al-Quds, the city of Jerusalem and Masjid al-Aqsa. And the ulama did these circles in cities he ruled. Damascus, for example, was one of them. He was ruling Damascus and Mosul. And while he was ruling, an opportunity for the Muslims opened up in Egypt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had destined for things to be this way. It was going to happen. 
It was going to happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listened to the du'as. Zinki would pray at night. Nuruddin Zinki was, you know, there is a story about him, although apocryphal. It is a legendary story, very famous story, that he had a dream that two people are trying to dig the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. Who has heard this story before? Put your hands up. SubhanAllah. It seems it's very famous. We could not trace the origin of this story, unfortunately. We cannot, we, we cannot authenticate it. It may not be true, but it's a very famous story. And this goes to show the level of influence Nuruddin Zinki himself, you know, exercised in Muslim minds and Muslim psyche for someone to even make up a story like this about him, right? That he saw a dream and he saw two people trying to dig the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. So he went and he caught those people. And the story goes that they had nearly reached the jasad, the jism, the body of Rasulullah, the blessed body of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, digging. So, then he blocked the grave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with molten metal. Okay, we don't know how true this story is. We don't know. But it's a very famous story. So, I want to highlight that it cannot be authenticated. It, it may well not be authentic. Nuruddin Zinki had a very special status in the minds and the hearts of the Muslims because of all the preparations he was making to undo the crusaders to get rid of them, to drive them out, okay? If the crusaders were a good force, if they were a just people, if they were a kind people, if they were a compassionate people, if they were if they were a people who allowed every single Muslim, community, Muslim or Jewish, to worship freely, then maybe the Muslims would not have been so hostile. But the crusaders themselves were poking Muslims, provoking Muslims, Every single opportunity to insult Islam and Muslims, they did it. They made Masjid al-Aqsa a stable for horses. Dome of the Rock became a stable for horses. Where you have verses in the Quran inscribed at the time of the Sahaba. Those verses inside the Dome of the Rock, you might have seen them. They were inscribed by Abdul Malik bin Marwan. When the Sahaba, Ashabu Rasul were alive, radiallahu anhum. So the crusaders are poking the Muslims. An opportunity came up. There was a clash between the vizier and the Fatimid caliph in Egypt. So this vizier, he reached out to Sultan Nuruddin Zinki for help because he wanted to be the vizier. And Nuruddin Zinki saw an opportunity in this. But the Fatimid Sultan had another candidate or the Fatimid, Fatimid Caliph had another candidate who asked this vizier. So, Nuruddin Zinki decided that he will send one of his generals to help the Fatimid vizier who came to help or came to ask for help. So, he sends one of his trusted generals called Shirku. Shirku was an uncle of Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi. Sultan Salahuddin was born in 1137 CE. He was born in 1137 CE in the city of Tikrit, northern Iraq. And he came from the Kurdish stock. He was Kurd. He was a Kurd. And he grew up in this city under, under the supervision. Uh, and then his family had moved to Mosul, Mosul uh, because they couldn't uh, stay in the city of Tikrit any longer because they had some disagreements with the caliph in Baghdad. His family, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi's father, uh, Najmuddin uh, Ayyub, he had issues with the caliph. So he was... Uh, first a governor of the city or the principality of Tikrit and he was asked to leave. The very day they were leaving Tikrit for Mosul to move to Mosul under the supervision of the Zinkis, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi was born. 1137 he was born on that very day when the family was moving from Tikrit to Mosul. So he grew up in Mosul under the supervision of Nuruddin Zinki. Nuruddin was one of Salahuddin's teacher. 
one of his teachers so shirku when he was given this task in 1164 ce 1164 so salahuddin is about 26 years old at this time 26 27 years old he didn't want to go with his uncle he didn't want to leave mosul he didn't even see a plan for himself he was a normal standard outgoing young man okay it's like look at yourselves today what is a normal outgoing young man nowadays i don't want to ask about east london i don't know what that means in east london yeah sorry no insult or birmingham or manchester okay or some other parts of london so let's take um, yeah would can someone help me what is a normal outgoing person in london a young man although east london is a separate country <laughs> what is a normal so sultan salahuddin was a normal young man you know he was into the cultural practices of the time even drinking even drinking not many people know this you know many people when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them um when allah gave them um, power they changed for be- for the, for the best they changed for the best there are a few examples okay one is umar bin abdul aziz very lavish okay young man as an umayyad prince in damascus very very la- living a lavish life as soon as he becomes the khalifa he switches completely i mean he was already on his way to become like that he was on a trajectory obviously things don't happen from a vacuum all of a sudden but he made serious changes to his life and his wife was fatima who was a princess she was the daughter of abdul malik bin marwan and she was a sister of two caliphs daughter of a caliph sister of two caliphs and wife of a caliph imagine that woman fatima the wife of umar bin abdul aziz he told her he said no more luxuries i am now a caliph no more luxuries she said i am with you i am with you and you know it is said about umar bin abdul aziz that when he would do the work of the state he would burn the lamp of the state from that oil how trivial a matter is that but when he would be done by done with that work and he's now doing his personal stuff he would burn his own lamp he wouldn't even burn oil from the state even though he could, you know one would ask him questions it would be perfectly fine for him to do it because he's the caliph he's in duty of uh, in the duty of islam and muslims so he is one example another example is sultan salahuddin when he came to power when he became the sultan as we will see he completely switched completely changed his character you know all of that outgoing being a young man uh, you know whatever that means at that time you know that definitely included drinking many sultans and princes were into drinking this was normal for them that's what they, that that was the lifestyle i mean you may not imagine that today because mashallah our level of taqwa is very very high as you know you know so we cannot imagine that but they their munkar sometimes coexisted with islam they were very strong islamic characters they loved islam they had a lot of ghira for islam but at the same time they had these weaknesses in the characters they had these weaknesses on the side okay so never expect perfection if you see some strong person doing great work for islam don't expect him to be an angel who landed from the heavens don't expect jibrail israfil azrail from them don't okay or don't expect a prophet from a muslim what happens is someone is doing good work for the ummah allah has given someone strength to lead the ummah on a particular matter and you see a slight weakness in his character ya allah khalas finished go home finish you you no body haram okay and you give a fatwa on him and you finish him off so we lose great potential we lose the goodness this person may have brought to us okay and some of the sahaba had this attitude no doubt but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he always looked at the strengths of the people and he used them accordingly so sultan salahuddin ayubi 
If you saw him as a young man, you would think, is this, is this going to be the great sultan who will liberate? You would not believe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change affairs, right? So he didn't want to join his uncle Sharku. So this wazir was called Shawar. They went to help Shawar. So in 1164, Sharku and his nephew called Yusuf bin Ayyub, also known as Salahuddin, they go to Egypt. So Sharku manages to appoint Shawar to the power or to, to, the, to the position of wazir. So Shawar becomes wazir again. Okay. And now having done that, he's done his job in Egypt. Shawar tells him, go back now. You have appointed me as the wazir. I am now the wazir again for the Fatimid Caliph. You have to go back. Take 30,000 gold dinars and on your way. Be on your way. He said, no. Nuruddin Zinki had realized that this opportunity may not come again. Because in order to drive out the crusaders, you must dismantle the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt. If you do not have Egypt, you cannot take the land of Palestine. You cannot take the land of Palestine. So Sultan Nuruddin Zinki knew this. He knew that if this army goes back to Mosul, we may not get this opportunity again. So he told Shirku to stay put. Stay where you are. Refuse the offer. And they did stay. And intrigues continued. Many battles took place between the Fatimids and the, the Ayyubids, right? But in 1169 CE, Shawar dies, the wazir, so does Shirku. Shirku also dies. Long story short. And now, who is going to take over? Who is going to take power from him? Who is going to be appointed in his place? So, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi at the time, being a young man, was a, was a very shy person, very timid, quiet type of person, although was a warrior, was a warrior. He had led battles against the crusaders already as a young man with his uncle. Okay. He had fought the crusaders already in Egypt by this time. So he was a battle hardened young man who had been tried and tested on the battlefield. In fact, he commanded the right wing of the army in one of the major battles against the crusaders. How the militaries worked or how their strategy worked at the time was there would be three parts of the army. They had Qalb, the heart of the army where the general or the king himself would be present in the army. You know, in those days, kings and generals fought on the battlefields. Not like today, you know. Not like today. They, they would have to be on the battlefield. Otherwise, no one would, no one would take them seriously. If a king or the general is not present in the battle, on the battlefield, that army wouldn't have any courage, would, wouldn't have any reason to fight. So Sharku was in Qalb, Salahuddin's uncle. And Salahuddin, Sultan Salahuddin, Rahmatullah was given the Maimana. So there would be Qalb, there would be Maimana, and there would be Maisara. So Maimana is basically the right wing of the army on the battlefield. And Maisara is the left wing of the army on the battlefield and there is Qalb in the middle. So there would be three parts of the army on the battlefield led by three different people. And there would be one general or one uh, commander of the army who would send, instru uh, send uh, instru instructions to both other wings. So Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi had already commanded the right wing for his uncle against the crusaders in a very major battle. So he knew how to fight wars and battles but was not a very loud person. So the Fatimid Caliph, when the wazir was lost, he was advised by his advisors that this timid young man seems to be very weak among all these Kurdish generals and Kurdish uh, military men. So just appoint him as the wazir. You know, that means you'll be fine. Just appoint him. This is what we call politics. You know, when you choose the most the weakest character of all. Okay. So they thought this guy is not going to give us trouble. This is stated by Imam, Imam Ibn Lathir in his history. 
when he wrote about Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, he said, this is why the Fatimid Caliph appointed Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, not knowing that this is the very man who will dismantle this caliphate, the Shia Ismaili Caliphate of Egypt. So in 1171, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi becomes the Sultan. So in 1169, he's appointed as the Vizier. When he becomes the Vizier, many people start the Fatimid establishment, which was the ruling class, and the masses in Egypt were all Sunni, by the way. The population of Egypt was Sunni. The population of Egypt was either Sunni or Christian, Coptic Christians, right? The ruling class, the ruling elite were a very small number of people, the Fatimids. They were not, I mean, they were not liked by the population. The population didn't want them to rule, but they're ruled by, you know, by power and money. So, when he became the wazir, his next target was to simply remove or dismantle this threat because the Fatimids were consistently siding with the Crusaders. Every time a Sunni Muslim power like the Seljuks, the Zingis, every time they fought the Crusaders, the Fatimids would help them. But now they were stuck. They were stuck. So Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi removed Slowly, he removed the caliph from his power. Al-Adid, his name was Al-Adid, was removed. And in 1171, he himself became the Sultan of Egypt. Now, there was a situation. There was a situation. Okay. Nuruddin Zinki had a plan. Rahmatullah That once we have secured Egypt, then we will have the back of the crusaders. Where is Nuruddin Zinki? He is in Syria. He's ruling from Damascus and Mosul, right? Egypt is on the other side. And in between Syria and Egypt, what, what do you find? Which land? Palestine. So Palestine is in between. And Palestine is ruled by the Crusaders. There are four principalities, right? So in order to take the Crusaders and defeat them, you must take Egypt. You must secure the back of the Crusaders. Otherwise, they will use it against us. So now Egypt is secured. But there is a problem. The problem is Salahuddin becomes independent. First, he was very, very obedient to Nuruddin Zinki because he was one of his servants. He's the one who sent him. Nuruddin Zinki sent Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi. But he became more powerful than Nuruddin Zinki himself. Because Egypt was a powerhouse. It has always been a powerhouse. It is a powerhouse today. Egypt, for one reason, among many other reasons, is very, very important. Why? Sorry? The canal is recent. Suez Canal is recent. It wasn't there before. But one reason. Why? Agriculture. River Nile. River Nile it gave agriculture to Egypt and Egypt was the breadbasket of even the Roman Empire. Egypt was very important. If you have Egypt, you have a very strong supply of grain, which is strategically very important. And grain means money. At that time, these communities, these societies were agricultural societies predominantly. There was hardly any industry, right? So anyone who has access to agriculture So Sultan Salahuddin, he takes Egypt and now Nuruddin Zinki starts to feel that he is now asserting independence. And there comes a time that now they want to face each other. So Nuruddin Zinki wants to take Egypt from Sultan Salahuddin. And Sultan Salahuddin is not simply giving it up. He's saying, no, Egypt, I know Egypt. None of your Seljuk Turks will be able to rule this territory. I've been here for a very long time. So let me rule it and we can work together. But Sultan Nuruddin Zinki had advisors who were telling him, no, we must take Egypt. So while he was preparing his armies to come to Egypt to fight Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, in 1174, he passed away, rahmatullahi He died before this uh, took place. So Allah didn't want them to fight each other. Allah didn't want them to confront each other. And Allah had chosen one of them to rule the Muslims, to unite the Muslims. Who was that? 
And Salahuddin was more able, clearly more able in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah had two choices, right? Allah could have, cho- Allah could have chosen Nuruddin Zinki, but Allah chose Sultan Salahuddin to do the job. So Nuruddin Zinki, before he could take any action, military action against one of his own clients, Allah took him. He died. And when he died, one of his young sons, uh, succeeded him and he was clearly not able to rule. So now this was an opportunity for Sultan Salahuddin to take back the land of Syria from the Zingis uh, or the Seljuks, right? So one after another, Sultan Salahuddin Ayubi went for Muslim territories to unite them. And he had one goal in mind. His entire life had one mission. And that mission was the liberation of Jerusalem and the liberation of Masjid al-Aqsa. This is what he was doing all this for. This is why he was going around the Muslim world trying to unite the Muslims. Okay, so he took Yemen. He took Yemen. He took Hijaz. And he also took the land of Syria from the Zengids. So now the Muslim Ummah for the first time in the Middle East, is united under one sultan. It took him a long time, many battles, many hard-fought battles against the crusaders and his own Muslim brothers who would not allow him to unite the Muslims. He had to fight the crusaders and his Muslim brothers in order to unite, okay? Because many a times you will see that despite the fact that we see potential and strength and power of character and leadership in a person, but because we have our own personal agendas, we will pull his legs. This happens in your masjid committees. This happens in your charities. This happens in any Muslim project. Everyone is a philosopher. Everyone is a politician. Everyone thinks they can conquer the world. Yes or no? Yes? Okay. There is a very famous story about Afghans. Even this story, I mean, I like to tell stories even if they're not true. But I also highlight at the same time, the story may not be true. Alexander the Great, when he came to Afghanistan, there's a famous story. He was finding it very difficult to control these people, to conquer them. So his mother said, what kind of people are you dealing with? You went from Macedonia all the way to Afghanistan was called Bactria at the time. So you, what, what is so special about Bactrians? So he said, okay, I'll send you a few. So he sent few Bactrians, Afghans, to his mother. And then when they came, uh, although the story is apocryphal, may not be, (laughs) clearly not, I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true. But the moral is true. When I finish, you you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So these few Afghans were sent to the mother of Alexander the Great. She asked them, who is the leader? Every single one of them, I am. She said, no, I want one of you uh, to be the leader. They said, no, I am the leader. Every single one of them, I'm the leader. While they insisted that they are all the leaders, they started to fight each other in front of the queen, in front of the mother of Alexander. And every single one of them killed each other. Right? So she said to Alexander, yeah, now I understand. Okay? And when Russia left, This is exactly what happened. Every single one of them, these warlords with immense weapons at their disposal, they wanted to be the king, right? This is exactly how the Muslim Ummah has been, unfortunately. Our greatest struggle has been to recognize leadership and leave the leader to do his job. One of the greatest struggles in the history of Islam has been rebellions. Rebellions against rulers and leaders rebellions upon rebellions and always these people find an excuse to rebel they will find one excuse or another to rebel against the ruler and destroy the to to wreak havoc in the community in the society always always these people who want to rebel okay they will find excuses and you know this is not i'm not talking about right now in 20th century go back read the history of islam Go to the Ottomans, go to the Mughals, go to the Ayyubids, go to Al-Andalus. Any Muslim dynasty or Central Asian dynasties, the biggest problem they had was rebellions. 
And Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi was exactly the same. You know, rebellions, non-stop rebellions. So he eventually crushed all of them. And he managed to rule all these territories. And now was the time to deal with the crusaders once and for all. And Allah caused an incident to happen that boiled the blood of the Muslims so much that they all united again under one leader. And this is exactly, you know, what's happening today. What's happening today in Palestine, the bombings of Gaza, the shredding of little children by these bombs, you know, it is already boiling the blood of all the Muslims and non-Muslims around the world. You can see it, right? So there was this foolish Frankish knight called Reynold de Chatillon. Reynold de Chatillon was the ruler of a castle called Kerak. Current day Jordan. You know where the Battle of Muta took place. The Battle of Muta took place in Jordan, current day Jordan, between the Sahaba, you know, the famous battle where Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an led the Muslims for the first time on the battlefield. Because the first three generals of the Muslims appointed by the Prophet sallallahu were all shaheed. Abdullah bin Rawaha, Jafar bin Abi Talib, and Zaid bin Haritha. All three of them were killed one after another in this battle. And then they were left with nobody to, rule, to, to, to lead. And Khalid bin Walid was present. He had recently accepted Islam. He said, you're the only person we can think of to lead this army. So he led the army against the Romans. Extraordinary odds. And he's protected the army, strategically brought them back to Medina. Having inflicted heavy losses upon the Romans and then managed to take back the Muslims. This place, Muta, is very close to this castle called Kerak. If you go to Jordan today, you want to go to this battlefield, this place where the Sahaba fought this famous battle against the Romans, and they, the covers are there. The covers of the three Sahaba are there, even to this day. You will see the castle of Kerak, K-E-R-A-K, -E very close to this place. Reynold de Chatillon ruled from this castle, and this castle fell on a pilgrim route. The Hajjaj, they would go for Hajj and Umrah from this route. So, there was a treaty between the crusaders and the Muslims. And Sultan Salahuddin, having consolidated his power already, united the Muslim Ummah under one ruler. And by the way, he never declared his independence from the Caliph in Baghdad. Even though he was a lot more powerful and influential and rich than the Caliph in Baghdad, he did not challenge his office. The khutbah from the masajid was read in the name of the caliph. This is how obedient he was to Muslim authority himself. Being the sultan himself, being more powerful than the caliph himself, having larger armies than the caliph, caliph had nothing. The caliph in Baghdad was powerless. He paid homage to him. So now he was waiting for an opportunity and the opportunity was provided by this fool called Reynold de Chatillon. He saw a pilgrim a caravan passing through his territory. He decided to attack them. He attacked the caravan and it is claimed that one of the sisters of the Sultan was in the caravan. And this boiled the blood of the Muslims so much. In fact, he took the Muslims into the dungeons of the castle. If you go and see the castle, which stands to this day, you will understand what might have been going through the minds of the Muslims at that time who were imprisoned in this castle because I've been there, I've seen it, right? You go inside the dungeons, it's pitch dark, very scary, all stones around you. So he said to the Muslims who were imprisoned, he, where is Muhammad? Call him, where is he now? Why doesn't he come and save you? Because these people worship Jesus Christ and they were so ignorant about Muslims that they thought we worship Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa so he was telling the Muslims, call Muhammad now to save you. Where is he? And the news reached Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi. And the Muslims came around and they united against his person. And lo and behold, long story short, there was a huge battle that took place in this place called Hittin. 
in 1187 CE in July, the crusaders, they got together, the coalition came to fight the Muslims. And Sultan Salahuddin had strategically cornered them already. Muslims already had water in their possession. So they had already positioned themselves on top of the wells and water supply. So water was completely uh, taken away from the crusaders. On top of that, Muslims started to light the grass and the fields around the crusader army. So that basically increased the heat. So they became more and more thirsty. They got exhausted. And when they got exhausted, the Muslims, they finished them off. All the Templars, the core, the core of this army uh, were the Templars. They were a specific group. They were very, very battle-hardened, tough fighters. Okay. It is said that when they would charge with their horses, I don't know if you have seen some medieval, uh, you know, war demonstrations when uh, many horsemen on their horses with their spears, when they charge together in a line, in a line. You might have seen some movies like, you know, uh, you know, there are scenes from the, this movie I watched back in the day, Braveheart. Okay. There are scenes that horsemen with the big spears, they would charge together. That charge was so terrifying that Muslim historians write about it, that it was unstoppable. Even the Muslims, with all their courage and all the Iman and all the power, they could not stop the charge of the Crusaders. It was so vicious. It was so well organized. And it was so terrifying that they would not be able to stop it. So imagine... 200 horses lined together with people, with, with knights, uh, with javelins and spears in their hands and they're charging together. That sight alone was terrifying. It was terrifying. So these were the Templars, the Crusaders, the Templars. So this was the end of the Crusaders. This was the beginning of their end. After the battle of Hittin was lost, the next thing the Sultan did was he went and besieged Jer Jerusalem. He wanted to take the city of Jerusalem. And long story short, the crusaders who were defending the city, they surrendered upon a treaty. And the Muslims wanted to avenge what happened in 1099 when the crusaders came in. The Sultan prevented every single Muslim from doing this on pain of death. He said, anyone who is found to be doing this, killing people inside the city, because this is not Islam. We don't have the crusaders as our teachers. Our teacher is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We have rules and principles. We are bound by principles. We cannot go and kill women and children like they did. We cannot do that. Even if you want to avenge what happened then, you can't do it. So the city of Jerusalem was open. Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi went inside and he washed Masjid al-Aqsa and Dome of the Rock with the rose water. After 90 years of occupation, after 90 years of occupation, this was one of the greatest events in the history of Islam. And you know, throughout the Muslim world, people prayed for the Sultan and his army for achieving this for the Muslims. For the first time after 90 years, Muslims prayed in Masjid al-Aqsa. It was washed with rose water. The Sultan himself, himself being a king, himself was on the floor, washing the floor of Masjid al-Aqsa, Allahu Akbar, rahmatullahi alayhi. And his generals and his army, everyone was, and then they took down the crosses from Masjid al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock and put up, the, you know, the Islamic symbols. And uh, the city was opened for the Jewish people as well and the Christians. Sultan said to all the Christians in the city, crusaders and otherwise, you may remain in peace. No one will brutalize you so long as you are peaceful. Don't cause any problems. And those crusaders who want to go back to Europe, we will take you in security to the coast. Now, Sultan provided his own military for their safety because the masses, the people of Palestine, the Muslims, they were boiling with anger. But the Sultan protected these people. No wonder William of Tyre, one of the crusaders, he is one of the main crusader 
historian who was writing at the time. He was alive at the time of the Sultan. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, those of you who are watching right now, if you haven't studied the history of the Crusades, you haven't studied anything. It's so amazing. It's so powerful. It's so inspirational that it's unbelievable. There are so many things and so many deeds I simply cannot cover in this short sitting. My time is up. So I have to stop, uh, st stop very soon. But you know, what I have addressed today is not even the tip of the iceberg. These are main details, main events. Sultan Salahuddin, he's freed thousands of crusaders. No wonder William of Tyre, one of the crusaders writing at the time, he said, this man, Salahuddin, was courageous, was wise, and generous, merciful, merciful. You know why they were writing this? You know why they were writing this? Because every time the crusaders dealt with him, they found him to be very merciful and compassionate. He had no personal vendetta against them. He was doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is an incident narrated by one of his personal biographers, Sheikh Bahauddin Ibn Shaddad, who was one of his biographers and also one of his teachers. One of his teachers who was with him, uh, during all these incidents, he was with him on the battlefield. He saw him firsthand. <coughs> he writes that once we were in our tents or in, in the camp, the military camp, and a crusader woman, a crusader woman, a Frankish woman had lost her daughter. She was kidnapped, stolen from her by some Muslim thieves. What happens? She goes to the crusaders. She cries to them that my daughter has been taken away. She has been kidnapped. The crusaders said, we cannot help you. We cannot help you in this hostile territory. We are in war. There is a war going on. On the other side, there are the Muslims and on this side is us. So what are we going to do? But then they said to her that the king of the Muslims... He is merciful. Who is saying this? The crusaders telling this woman, the king of the Muslims is merciful. He will help you. If anyone can help you, it's him. So she crosses the lines. She comes to the Muslim side and she insists that she wants to see the Sultan. She's brought in front of the Sultan and Bahauddin ibn Shaddad is narrating what he's seeing himself. She comes and then no one understands the language. So they bring a translator. Someone who interprets her words. She tells him that my daughter was kidnapped and I want help. And she's crying at the same time. The Sultan immediately tells his men, go and find her daughter. And don't come back until you find her. So they go, they find her. Some people were trying to sell her. So those men get arrested. The girl is freed and she's reunited with the mother within some short span of time. So when the girl comes back to the mother, she falls on the floor and she starts throwing sand on her face out of happiness and crying at the same time out of excitement. And Sultan, when he sees this, he starts to cry. When he sees this compassion of the mother for her daughter and the way she was praying for the Sultan, Bahauddin ibn Shaddad narrates that we did not understand what she was saying. But we knew she was praying for the Sultan. Because she was looking at him and she was throwing sand on her face. She was so grateful to him that, you know, how can this even happen? How can you even do this? In war! And there are many, many, many stories like this about Sultan Salahuddin. You know, you'll be authentically narrated by his own personal biographers. There are many. There is one by Imaduddin uh, al-Isfahani. He is an author. The, the one of the best ones I strongly recommend everyone to read from Salahuddin. And Nawadir Sultania is a personal, it's a biography of Sultan Salahuddin Ayubi, authored by his own teacher, Bahauddin Bahaud ibn Shaddad. So, after taking Jerusalem, Sultan Salahuddin, he goes for other crusader territories and he fights many, many battles. Then, after Jerusalem fell, to the Muslims, what happens next? Allahu Akbar. I'm going to fast forward very quickly. I want to finish so that we can take questions as well, inshallah. What happens? Again, the ripple effects reach the Pope in Rome. And it is said that Pope 
when he heard the news that Jerusalem fell to the Muslims, he collapsed and died on the spot. Possibly had a heart attack or something. He heard the news and he collapsed on the spot and died. The new Pope, he announces another crusade. Crusade, crusade, crusade. Get Jerusalem back. How can we lose Jerusalem? This is the defeat of Christendom. This is the defeat of the papacy. This is the defeat of Catholicism. This is the defeat of our religion. Take Jerusalem back. And then what happens? The king of England and parts of France, Richard the Lionheart, he decides that he will go and fight Salahuddin. Already the name of Salahuddin, Salahuddin is the most famous man in Europe. His name is already every single church, every single household, Saladin, Saladin, Saladin. Richard, when he decided to go on the crusade to liberate Jerusalem once again, liberate or take back the city from the Muslims, he imposes a tax on the English people. English people, people here, right, you know, in this country. And the tax is called what? Saladin tax. It's called Saladin tithe. Literally, I'm not making this up, by the way. It's historically attested. The tax was called Saladin tax. And he even said that I would even sell London if I could to the highest bidder to raise money to go and fight the crusade. So from here, Richard, he decides to go on the crusade. With him, the king of France, Philip, also wants to join the crusade. And then from Germany, one of the biggest armies in Europe at the time, Frederick Barbarossa, the German king, nearly 80 years old, over 80 years old, he decides to go on the crusades. Now, long story short, when these people leave, um, you know, their respective territories to head towards the Middle East, the Muslims already heard the news that these huge armies are coming. Allahu Akbar. Especially Frederick Barbarossa was coming from land. So when the German army came close to the Muslim territory, the Muslims started to pray Qunut. Qunut al-Nazila. Muslims started to pray Qunut to Allah. Ya Allah, you, you, only you can save us now. We don't have the power to fight these big armies coming from Europe. Okay? Because this was the loss of Jerusalem, you have to understand to them, was a huge blow. So they pray Qunut al-Nazila. Guess what happened? The emperor, the German emperor, Frederick Barbarossa, while crossing a river, falls from his horse in the river and the water is waist high. It's not even deep. The water is waist high. But, you know, at that time, the knights, the warriors used to wear armor, heavy armor on their bodies, right? So he fell into water and he could not come back up. He was drowned by his armor and he died in that river. And once he died, his entire army lost the will. They lost the, the courage to continue and they got dispersed. And many of them were killed off by the peasants. So that's gone. Richard comes and takes Acre. Long story short, it takes him a year, a year to reach Palestine when he starts. Okay. So he comes and takes Acre, the city of Akka in current day Palestine. And then there are 3,000 Muslims inside. But before he takes the city of Acre, they besiege the city. Now, this is something shocking. You'll find this very difficult to understand and appreciate. For two years, are you listening, everyone? For two years, the city of Acre was besieged. For two years. Okay? And on the other side, Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi remained for two years outside the city of Acre, trying to rescue it. For two years, this man did not move from one spot. For two long years, one battle over one small city called Acre was fought. And there were 3,000 Muslims inside the city. Eventually, Richard succeeds in taking the city. And when he takes the city, he basically takes all the Muslims in the city hostages, 3,000 of them. And then he tells the Sultan, money or they die. 
so he wanted gold sultan salahuddin ayubi could not raise the gold in time and in one day richard in cold blood killed 3000 men women and children muslims this is called the massacre of acre okay and the muslims are so angry when this happened so richard started to take the land so how he did this after taking the city of acre he started to make his way down towards the city of jerusalem because he, because why did he come to palestine from england even though he never lived in england he was mainly living in the french territory he spoke french he didn't even speak english okay so he ruled more territory in france than he did in britain right so he came with his army took the coastal route there were ships supplying from the sea and on the land the other side the muslims were also following the crusader army and there were many skirmishes muslims tried to stop richard in his tracks but they couldn't he was a very 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 able fighter richard was a vicious fighter he was not only a very powerful king but he was a very strong general and he commanded his men like a block even in the battle of asruf in the battle of asruf the muslim lines and the crusader lines were drawn against each other this was a f- very famous battle that took place between the 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 crusaders and the muslims and the christians charged the muslims as i mentioned earlier and the muslims could not stop the charge and then richard bahaudin ibn jaddad writes in his history the same biographer of the of the sultan he writes that on that day richard with a spear in his hand was running the length of the muslim army up and down and challenging muslims is there a man among you will come and fight me is there a man muslims are so terrified of his leadership his person that no muslim came forward to challenge him this is similarly what you know at the time of the prophet when ibn al-wud he came to the muslims then he said is there a man among you he challenged the sahaba who stood up who stood up to challenge him ali, ali bin abi talib three times the prophet told him to sit down because ali was a very young man at the time he didn't want him to be killed ibn al-wud was a great warrior well very well known warrior in arabia when he was challenging them. so ali eventually ended up ended up fighting him and killed him so right like was richard was running the length of the muslim army with a spear in his hand on his horse and taunting the muslims so the muslims could see that this man is very different this enemy is a very different person we're dealing with this is a different breed okay and richard was no doubt was a very uh, you know valiant and vicious fighter not only himself personally but as a military general as well and now he came very close to the city of jerusalem having taken much of the territory the muslims are doing their strategic games and the details can be read in the books i've already mentioned okay so i'm cutting the long story short so richard comes close to the city of jerusalem having come from france having raised taxes from britain he is almost Six miles or six kilometers away from the city of Jerusalem, and you know the Sultan is inside the city of Jerusalem. Guess what? What what is the situation? What do you think is happening inside the city of Jerusalem? This is the same man who massacred three thousand Muslims in cold blood in the city of Acre. What do you think is he going to do? What do you think he's going to do when he takes the city of Jerusalem? Massacre, and who's inside? The king. sultan himself and now the advisors of the sultan are coming to him and they're telling him sultan leave the city live today fight tomorrow this guy clearly he has reached this far and we couldn't stop him let him take the city and we will besiege them we will deal with them like we dealt with the crusaders before them the sultan did not want to leave the city he said i will die here if i have to I will die in this city if I have to with the people. What does he do? He goes to his teacher. Are you listening? Yes. He goes to his teacher. Who is the teacher? Bahaudin Ibn Shaddad, the one who wrote his biography later on, An-Nawadir Sultaniyah. 
He goes to his teacher and he asks him, what do I do in this situation? Richard is here and these people are going to be massacred and I don't want to leave the city. Al-Quds, Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa. I cannot leave it. Sheikh Bahauddin ibn Jaddad asked him, who gives victory? Who has the power? Allah. So go and ask Allah. Go and ask Allah. The Sultan comes to Masjid al-Aqsa and he stands on the mat. Bahauddin ibn Jaddad narrates that I could see his grey beard moving. You know, his, his beard was grey. Possibly from grief of all these years. His beard was moving and he was reading. And his tears were flowing down from his cheeks. And when he made sajda, the prayer mat was filled with his tears. Crying to Allah. Ya Allah, it's up to you now. Ya Allah, I am powerless. Whatever. Whatever he was praying. And for some reason, Richard decides, having come from Britain and France, having brought so much pain and suffering to not only his own army, but to the Muslims as well, for some reason, he decides to go back. Turns around from the doors of the city of Jerusalem. And his companions, crusaders, they said, at least look at the city. Go and look at it. He said, I will not even gaze upon it. I will not look at the city. I will not look at something I cannot take. He turns around and he's, he goes back to where he came from and could not take the city of Jerusalem. Historians argue a number of different things and they stay in, say a number of different things. Why? Because the city was basically in the hands of the Muslims. The, the territory around the Crusaders was hostile. The Muslim population was hostile. All the water wells had been poisoned already outside. There was no water supply. They were away from the sea. Okay. So this was a lost battle to Richard. There was no point of fighting this battle. So he decides to go back. Even without trying to conquer the city. Never sees it. Doesn't even look at the city. Goes back. And then Sultan Salahuddin Ayubi and the Muslims cannot believe it. Whether it was his du'as or the Muslim du'as and the Muslim kunuts. That's why they say never underestimate the power of du'a. Just like you guys prayed tonight. Believe in Allah. Believe in his decree. Things will change. وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not despair. Do not be in grief. You will be victorious if you are believers. So do not underestimate the power of dua. And do your best to help your brothers and sisters. Do your best to help your brothers and sisters. So Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi survives. So does the Muslim army. And Richard goes back. And Richard, fighting a minor battle in France, besieging a castle, uh, gets shot in the neck by a crossbow by an, another, another soldier, a French soldier, and he dies as a result. And he tells the, his, his soldiers that they should bury his heart in the city of Rhone in, in France. And uh, his body was buried in another place. I uh, forgot the name of the city where he was buried. Subhanallah. Okay, so you can see he's a Fiji, you know, they used to make a Fiji's true likeness of the king or the queen on the grave. You can go and see uh, in France, if you ever see him, you can see the pictures. So this man was clearly a very special, no doubt, okay, with special qualities and characteristics, okay. And uh, when he was in Palestine, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi communicated with him, even sent him his physician. And he actually praised the Sultan for his, his bravery. This is, this is a man. I'm dealing with not just any ordinary person. This guy, this person I'm dealing with is not an ordinary man. Okay. And likewise, the Sultan respected Richard for his leadership and all the, the great qualities he possessed, although using them for the, the wrong ends. You know, when you go outside uh, Westminster Abbey, there used to be a statue of Richard on a horse with a sword in his hand, right? You know, Richard, before leaving for the Crusades, one of the <laughs> events that took place unfortunately, was the massacre of the Jewish people in London. And they came to pay homage to him and they got massacred. This is Richard the Lionheart. 
Okay. If anyone's a lion artist, it was Salahuddin. And he became very, very popular. Finally, this man, Salahuddin, Rahmatullah, died in 1193, having done this great service to Islam and Muslims, taking, having taken back the city of Jerusalem, the land of Palestine from the Crusaders. Okay. Although the Crusaders remained in the Middle East for another 100 years, no doubt, but they were completely powerless. Their power was repeatedly reduced by the subsequent sultans, uh, first the Ayyubids and then uh, the, uh, the Mamelukes, and they did not give up. There were seven crusades in total. There were seven crusades in total to the Middle East. Even the English king, Edward I, the king in this movie, the, La, the Braveheart, you know, who punished William Wallace for being a freedom fighter for the Scots, right? Edward the Longshank, okay, was a very cruel king, no doubt. A very cruel king. Very effective king. I believe, I believe as a historian that he was one of the most important kings in English history. More so than Richard the Lionheart because what he did, his deeds outweigh the deeds of Richard by far. He was very, very, um, a, a very successful king, as bad, as evil, as, you know, as vicious as he was. But as a king, as a pragmatist, he was very, very successful. He was able to subdue the Welsh. Even he went to, for a crusade. Even he went for a crusade in the 13th century. A, almost a century after Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi. And he was nearly killed. Right? So crusades continued. But Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi died in 1193. And you know when he died, how he died, he had sheikhs reading the Quran right next to him. He was listening to the Quran. He had specifically requested for the sheikhs to read the Quran next to him while he's dying. So last thing in his life was the Quran. And it is written that when he died, he had very few silver coins in his possession and one gold dinar. That money was used, specifically kept for his coffin. So he was basically, the coffin was bought from that money and he was put in the grave. He was a very kind and generous person. There are so many virtues that I can simply not describe in this short sitting. For that, you will have to read the books I have mentioned, An-Nawadir Sultania by Bahauddin ibn Shaddad. So on that note, brothers and sisters, thank you so much for listening. I simply haven't done justice to this man's history and his legacy. There is a lot more I could discuss and talk about with regards to his character, his personal achievements, his person, his, 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 his as a Muslim, his prayers, his reading of the Quran, his patronage of the scholars and the ulama, him being surrounded by the ulama and listening to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ every single day. All these things I could mention, but I could not because of the time restraint. Jazakumullah khairan, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. May Allah bless you. Thank you so much.